these kids, they're not all the same. They don't all like the same music. They might all like tacos. We did decide that we all like Thai food and tacos at the last service, so that was pretty good. But they don't all have the same dinner that they love. They don't all have the same anything, just like the rest of us. Jesus, in his message, in a very, very convoluted way, may I add, asks for us to all be one. But he doesn't say for us to all be the same, because that'd be really boring. He asks for us to be one in love. And that is the only thing that I told them. I said, if you remember nothing else from church for the rest of your entire life, that God created us in love and loves every one of us. That's all you need to know. All right. Amen, children's message. Good morning, friends. How's everybody holding together? How you doing? Chris is good. The rest of us a little come see, come sa, a little here and there. Some good, some not so great. It is good that we are here today, that we are here in this place on this Memorial Day weekend when we know that there is war right now and strife in the world. It is good that we are here today after a week of violent events such as what happened in Texas and I'm not going to name that any more specifically than that because there are a lot of kids who've heard way too much about that this week and so that's as far as I'm going to go but you know what I mean and it's been rough it's good to be here to remember to pray and to remember to learn how to act it is good that we are here for this service of healing and restoration. It's good that we have each other, friends. Karen and I were talking earlier this week as we were practicing for the 9 a.m. service together um, on Thursday that in this community, in this congregation in particular, we each take our turn. We each take our turns being the one whose world has caved in and being the one who's ready to catch the person who's struggling. And eventually, we all have our turns. We're practiced at holding one another up and singing the songs of God for each other, grateful to be shored up when we cannot sing ourselves. We take our turns being the ones who help and the ones who are in need. And there's no shame in it nary a wisp. There's no embarrassment here. There's no expectation of repayment or of apology. There's no expectation that you will say, oh, I'm fine, when you're not. We all go through it. Amen? On our congregation's Facebook page this week, I posted an event advertising in the prayer vigil that I just was like, ooh, we need to gather or at least have an opportunity to gather. And so I threw it together um, with a little help. And I put the Facebook ad up there so people would know that it was happening and they would know that they were invited and like that. And interestingly, that post um, has received a handful of people trolling it, saying, why don't you do something that matters? Prayers are useless. And so on, in that general vein of expression. Now, I immediately, of course, went, who are these people? <laughs> what are they doing here? Um, and none of the trolls uh, were from our area. But I definitely um, Facebook searched them real quick. And all of them um, were real people. They weren't like computer programs or hacks or anything like that. And they had families. They were giving to charities. They were concerned about the pandemic. They all had, re they're real people. Right? So I was like, oh. But my first response when I saw those is I was like, you don't know me. You don't know my congregation. This is my church. Our prayers matter a lot. Thank you very much. We do a lot around here. We're a social justice forward congregation. We are. We work really hard at helping people. But I didn't say that. And then I thought about deleting them. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Because I'm an admin and I can do that. <laughs> No need to keep that negativity out there for everyone to see, right? 
but I didn't do that either. And then I thought about engaging them, trying to explain who we are, trying to explain that we're not just thoughts and prayers, that we're trying to get them to see who we actually are and what we're about. But then I didn't do that either. Because instead I remembered something that a wise friend of mine said, and she said, never debate on the internet. Do not engage with people you do not know. It is emotionally exhausting, and there's no point. Just don't do it. And she's right, actually. Friends, advice, words of the wise. Just, if you don't know who it is, just leave it alone, right? And number two, the thing, the second thing that I thought when I didn't do anything with it was that I kind of have to admit there is nothing more frustrating than seeing and hearing politician after politician tweeting about thoughts and prayers and then doing nothing to affect change. Nothing that might start to curb the seemingly intractable pull of money and power in this country. So it turns out that after a little thought, I could actually see where they were coming from. And so I left it. I left it alone. I might have said a little prayer for them, though, just to be funny in my heart of hearts. And serious. Friends, the moral, the moral, the moral and political fractures in our country and around the world, everywhere, it seems like everywhere, NPR had plenty of international news about fracturing as well this morning, are starting to feel more permanent to me. It's starting to feel more settled, more ingrained, like this is just how it is now. In fact, I find it difficult in my lifetime to remember when it wasn't this way. People say, I hear like my dad say, well, there was a time when people could talk to each other with different opinions. And I'm like, okay, dad, but I'm like almost 50. And I don't remember that. The fractures go really deep beyond the national political landscape and religious misuse. It goes into neighborhoods, goes into family into church families even. And it's difficult to see a way forward that looks any different than the trajectory that we're currently on. You know? And it made me wonder, (laughs) as I was studying this text, this wonderfully convoluted prayer that Jesus gives us about being one, if Jesus is just talking about pie in the sky. Because it kind of feels like that to me. Is there any real chance that we could actually be one? Is that a thing? That we could get along with other people? That it could be different than it is? Jesus is pushing this concept of oneness pretty hard here at the end of this prayer with his friends right before he goes and gets crucified. But is it even realistic? Is there any way that we could be one, like Jesus and the Father are one, that we could model unity? Then I looked at the text one more time. The word unity is not in there. It's like what I said in the kids' message, right? It's not asking us all to be exactly the same. Not asking for cookie-cutter Christians to make everybody feel good about everything. It never says that Jesus and the Father are even the same or that they're monolithic. It says that they are one, that they work together, and their relationship is based in Love. It's love, friends. It's based in love. What if the oneness that Jesus is espousing isn't unity, but we're all in this together, love. We relate to one another, love. Think about Jesus and how he taught and how he lived and who he worked with. His ability to sit with and be with and appreciate and honor people who were completely different from him that he wasn't even technically supposed to be around at all. How he modeled oneness in that very, in his person, where he chose to be. Think of the story that he told about the Samaritan who helped the man who'd been beaten and despite the risk to himself in that. Or the woman at the well who had so many husbands And yet Jesus came and sat with her anyway. And that may not be as big of a deal today as it was then, but boy, howdy, it was a big deal then, right? The Syrophoenician woman, one of my favorite stories, who argues 
with Jesus when he says, I'm not going to heal your child. And she says, even the dogs deserve the table scraps. And he changed his mind and healed her anyway. The lepers, right? Nobody would touch a leper, but Jesus did. Of Zacchaeus, our favorite government official, the tax collector that Jesus loved. Jesus leading by example shows us that wherever we choose to draw our lines these days, pro-life, pro-choice, Republican, Democrat, you choose whichever line is the one that's feeling pressured to you right now. Jesus is always going to be on the other side of that line, showing us the humanity of those that we would choose to other despite their brokenness. Pretty sure that we're all broken too. What if oneness, the way that Christ is describing it and enacting it, means that we see each other fully and care for each other as fully as we can? What if it's not about complete agreement or always being on the same page or having a uniform belief system? What if instead it's just about your own heart Because that's the thing that you are in charge of, right? And keeping it soft. Allowing yourself not to become brittle. Or hard. Or rough. But keeping your heart soft. And open. To still allow yourself to listen. And to believe. And to work to help one another. When it's our turn to do that. Like I said at the beginning of this service. Sometimes it's our turn. If there's any hope to be found, any healing, any forward movement to end this national cycle of tragedy and trauma in our schools and churches, I think it has to come from staying tender, friends. Really listening to each other's hurts, trying to understand, leaning forward to help if we can at all, to comfort, to feed, to sing, to pray. I was looking through my feed, and this week, I don't know about all of you on social media, but the news feeds have been just overwhelming, a lot of stuff. But I found this one uh, person's quote, and I don't know who Erin Douglas is, but that's who this is from. And um, she says, today in the Starbucks drive-thru in Uvalde, the barista asked if I was taking time to take care of myself. When was the last time a Starbucks barista did that, by the way? And I told her I would keep trying, and then I returned the question. And she said she actually works in San Antonio, but is working in Uvalde so that the baristas there have time off to grieve. Do you think those baristas know each other? Probably not. Is that an action of someone trying to be in? to stay soft, to help, perhaps. You know, it might be easy to look at our congregation, and I'm looking at y'all right now, and say, they're all the same. They must all think the same, and feel the same, and be the same. And you say, well, no, some of us are Swedish, and some of us are Norwegian. (laughs) And I go, but I'm German. And a lot of you are really only vaguely Lutheran. I mean, let's be honest. But we're here, and we're not monolithic. We're not all the same. We don't hurt the same ways. We don't carry the same burdens. We don't all believe the same things. But we do know how to care. And we care well. I pray that we stay open, that we stay soft, that we ask God to keep us soft. And to share that world with the world as much as we can, in as many ways as we can. That we develop the oneness of Christ, not by being all of the same mind, but by holding together that at the end of the day, we're more alike than we are different. Which is absolutely true. Because that's where the rubber meets the road for Jesus. And he is the plumb line of how to care. Love God. Love your neighbor, 
Love yourself. Period. Thanks be to God. Amen.